moving on, we're now going to start having a look at the materials editor itself and how we apply materials to our objects. So the materials editor is really the interface that you're going to be using when you want to create your materials, when you want to apply them, when you want to edit them, all sorts of things. Really what you're going to find is it's really split into kind of two halves. We've got one section at the top here where you can view your materials and we've got a few extra options in there as well. And there's this section at the bottom which is very dynamic. So depending on what layer of your material you're at will depend on what you're seeing in this section of the materials editor. Obviously, if you've got a better resolution monitor than the one I'm using at the moment, you'll be able to see more information in there. So let's first of all have a look up here at the top section, uh, these spheres, these shader balls that we've got up here. And you'll notice that there's only six of them at the moment. If I was to right click on one of them, you can see I can pull up 24 of them. So that becomes a lot easier to sort of work with. Now what that means is that it means you've got 24 shader balls that you can edit at any one time. That doesn't mean to say that you're limited to only 24 materials in the whole scene. That's just what you can edit at the same time. And in actual fact, that's 24 standard materials. If I was to click here and pick one of these to be what's called a multi-sub-object material, you'll notice that if I, uh, if I keep my old material there, I've got a set number. And that set number can go all the way up to be a thousand. So that's 1000. Let me just wait for it to update here. That's going to be 1000. So you can see we start at number one here, and we go all the way down to 1000. 1000 standard materials just in this one material slot alone. So, in actual fact, if I just turn this back to standard, that means that you can edit up to 24,000 materials at any one time as well as having an unlimited number in your scene. So really there's no excuses. So just sticking towards this one standard material, I'll right click here and I'll take this back to be a three by two sample so things are easier to see. And I'll just start setting up a basic simple material as I would do sort of in everyday work. Now the first thing that I tend to do is I tend to click this button over here, which is the show background. And what that does is it's going to show up any reflections or any specularity or any highlights that I might have really nicely and really well. So that's helpful. The next thing I'll want to do is I want to apply that to the material. And I say that, that you know, we've just got a bog standard slate grey material here. There are several different ways that I could do this. I could left click and drag and drop onto that object. And you can see that one turns grey. And for a very small, very limited scene such as the one that we've got here, that's absolutely fine. However, if you do that in a large complex scene, chances are you're going to miss the object that you thought you were dropping onto and you're going to hit something else. And in that case, the mistake that you make at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning will be paid for at 9 o'clock on a Friday night trying to unpick it. The safest way by far to apply a material to an object is to select the object itself, you can see here, especially if I press F4, to select the material in the materials editor and then come down here third from the left, assign material to selection. Press that button and you can see the material is now assigned to my selection. It is by far the safest way of doing that. You'll also notice that we've got these little chevrons now in the corner of our material and those chevrons when they're solid mean that this material is applied to an object, not only applied to an object but it's applied to this object which is selected. If I deselect that object you notice that the chevrons become clear and just slightly grey. That means that that, op that material is applied to an object in the scene. Okay, so an object in the scene. Coming back to that material, there's a few other bits and pieces here that we want to, uh, we want to have a look at. Uh, the anatomy of material, again, uh, I've got different shader types that I might want to use here. We've got anastropic, that's good for brush metal. Blin is a good everyday shader. Uh, Multi-layer. Shader is like an anastropic, but it goes uh, in two different directions. Fong is good for shiny materials, such as glass or plastics. Uh, and really, Strauss and translucent shaders, we would use more for sort of things like skin or, or whatever. To be honest with you, a blin material will be good for about 80 or 90% of what you're going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Other basic things that I can do here within my materials editor are change the base color 
of my material. So if I make that a nice blue colour, you'll notice that the ambient is locked to that. Basically what the diffuse colour is, is to sort of give it, it, it its, um, its technical term, is it's the colour of the material when it's being lit by a light source or by the camera or being viewed by the camera at, uh, at or less than 90 degrees. And the ambient is when it's not being directly lit. Now we used to have to have these separate and make the ambient a darker version of the diffuse, which is all very well. But to be honest with you now, we really want to allow the ambient to be the same colour as the diffuse so that it will, so we, we let our lights take care of the bits that are lit and not lit. Really that was when renderers weren't that clever and they, well, machines weren't that fast. Things like your specular highlight, you really don't want this to be white. What you would like it to be is a lighter colour of the diffuse. So if I drag and drop that and copy it and then click on the specular highlight and make it a much lighter blue. Imagine, for example, uh, a car and a car with very blue paint. The highlight that you see from that when it was uh, a nice sunny day wouldn't be white. It would be a very light blue. And that specular highlight and level is also controlled down here from these very basic options that we've got here with specular highlight and level. And if I increase my specular level and my highlight, you can see we can make this a more and more glossy material every time we change one of those options. So that's, that's really rather quite good. I can change the opacity of the whole object here, or I control it, can control it by using a map. Now you'll notice that we've got these little squares here called none, and there's one there, none as well. And really, if I'm going to want to have something other than just controlling this with a, a very sort of simple um, hole, I was going to say sort of whole material, but just a whole sort of level of being the whole material is um, either opaque or it's transparent. If I want to say I want to have a material in there, I'll click on this none and then I'll be able to put a material in there. And we're going to actually talk about these a little bit later on in a little bit more detail. Other things I've got here are the maps. So each one of my map channels. If I want to add something into one of those map channels, again, I'll just click none and I have my whole material map browser that I can add various things like bitmaps or um, checkers, procedural maps into there, all sorts of different things that can actually be used in each one of these channels. And again, we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail later on, but really this is where you're gonna load them into. And also this is the amount of influence that that will have. So say for example, I put a, uh, a checker map into and you can see there we've changed the level that we're at. We're now down into the checker level. So what I'll do is I'll press this go to parent to take me back up to my main material. And I can say how much influence that checker will have over the blue colour in my diffuse level. And at the moment it's got 100%, so it's completely overriding it. Also, I can't see it in my viewport unless I press the show standard mapping viewport. And there you go, you can now see the checker. But if I reduce the amount in this value here, you can now see that we've got the blue coming into this quite a lot. You can actually see that this is basically blue, but with a black and white checker underneath it. So it's really quite useful. We can use this as some sort of form of blend between two different types of material. And we get some very interesting effects happening with that. You'll also notice our bump is set down to 30% by default. That's really just to stop you from shooting yourself in the foot and over bump mapping something. But as I say, we're going to be talking about bump and uh, specularity a little bit later on in a bit more detail. So really, just as far as the basics are concerned of your uh, materials editor, those are the basic things that you need to know. Uh, we've also got in here, just as an aside, a material map navigator, and that allows you to see your default level material here or go down into the checker map. And if you're creating very uh, complex materials, this is very useful. But as a starting point, as I say, that's all you really need to know is about how to change the colours, how to add sort of maps into various different elements of your material, and also how to assign your material to your selection and then view that material in the viewport. should also be noted that there are some different types of materials, such as a blend material, for example, or a composite material, where you can't see the end result in the viewport. So please bear that in mind that you can't do that. But apart from that, it's a very simple interface it's all very procedural and it's very quick to learn as well.